Awesome. Okay, well, welcome to today's session, Gaining Faculty Buy-in for OER Adoption and Development uh, Interactive Panel Discussion. On the agenda today is the uh, uh, CCC OER OE Global Overview. Uh, the EDI committee is seeking new members. Uh, the, a little bit about the OE Global Conference, our panel discussion, upcoming events, and staying in the loop. So welcome to uh, CCOER, a community of practice supporting and encouraging colleges in the collaborative development of open education programs to ensure equitable access and success. And there is a link being provided if you would like to learn more. Uh, the CCOER committee has opening in the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, their mandate is to advocate for open educational practice to empower contributions from diverse learners and educators who have been underrepresented. I know that I have been enjoying my time with the PD committee. I'm sure the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee is just as much fun and doing such important work. So please considering signing up to become a member of that committee. And a link's being provided in the chat. Great. And then we want to talk to you a little bit about, I don't know, who's excited about OE Global next week? Uh, but not to worry if you're not able to come because there is a connection for live stream sessions that no registration is required. And that link is uh, being provided to you in the chat. So uh, we're welcoming OE Global to Canada in Edmonton uh, by Norquest College um, and with a you know, a focus on indigenous worldviews, carbon neutral, diverse keynote speakers. I don't know, I was looking at the sketch and I'm pretty excited. It's gonna be really hard to choose uh, which sessions I wish to go to. So uh, if you can't uh, join us live, please uh, check out the live streamed events. Awesome. It's great to have that access, isn't it? So now I would like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Kimberly Carter. I'm an open educational resource consultant at Conestoga College in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. And part of my work is having consultations with faculty members to encourage them and to support them in adopting, adapting, and creating open educational resources for their courses and their programs. And I'd now like to invite my panel to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their roles and how it pertains to our topic today. And so panel, if you wanna do it in the order of which your images are, that would be great. Starting with Dr. Judith Pete. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, uh, Judith uh, Pete. I'm from Kenya and I work Work at Angaza University College as a senior lecturer and also the regional coordinator for service learning in the Africa Hub that constitutes five universities in Africa. Uh, I'm a passionate and an ambassador of OER and did all my thesis on OER from the Open University of the Netherlands. And I'm so happy to be here today to form part of this panel. And we are going to share and enrich ourselves with regards to issues pertaining equity, diversity, and inclusion. And more importantly, why are people resisting OER? It's a good thing. Thank you and most welcome. Thank you. And Jenny? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Heyman. I am a chair at Conestoga College and a colleague of Kim. Um, my responsibilities at Conestoga are for the online asynchronous program developments for the School of Business. Uh, and that's a unique opportunity for me to work with folks who are creating new courses and new programs uh, to kind of talk with them at the start of that creation process uh, for those courses and programs. Uh, why not consider OER? So that's a great um, part of my role that I really love. Nice to meet you all. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Gu and I am uh, with eCampus Ontario's Open Library. Uh, eCampus Ontario is a provincially funded nonprofit organization that leads a consortium of the province's publicly funded colleges, universities, and indigenous institutions. The Open Library itself has been part of the open education landscape in Ontario since its launch in uh, 2017. Uh, and we work to provide broad access to all to OER, as well as access to open publishing tools to Ontario's publicly assisted post-secondary institutions. I'm a librarian there, and I am in charge of uh, leading the library's operations and providing support to all of our new programs that are happening. Looking forward to learning with everyone. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Schudel. I am, as it says here, the chair of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Camosun College. I'm also an instructional designer in the e-learning unit there. So I have 50% uh, in each. And I also have 50% somewhere split into there is working a bit with uh, open education at the college. We are recent, uh, we have been doing open education for a long time, but the last five years I've been really getting involved with supporting faculty and finding out what's going on at the college. So very excited to hear what everybody has to say because uh, I think we've all experienced as many challenges with getting people on board with open education and sustaining that work. So thank you for inviting me. Hi everyone, Marie Rutherford. I'm from Georgian College in Barrie, Ontario. I'm faculty in the School of Business. I'm really excited for this conversation today as well. My journey with OER started about five years ago through uh, an Ontario Extend program offered through eCampus Ontario and the passion and the spark was ignited. And from there, I met like-minded people such as Kimberly and we collaborated on an OER project and it kind of grew from there. And since there's been four additional projects I've been part of and, and I just have such a passion for what we're gonna talk about today. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm known as Pooja Gupta and uh, uh, I teach upgrading mathematics and computer studies at Kamosun College and I'm also passionate about making education accessible for all my students and one way to do that is through open education resources and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning from all of you about how to um, make learning environments more accessible for both students and faculty. Thank you. Thank you, uh, panel. So uh, how we're going to work the panel today is I'm going to uh, pose a question and then invite my panel members to answer the question. But we don't want you just sitting there not to, not participating. So feel free to populate your answers into the chat or any questions that you have, and uh, we'll do our best to address them in a timely way. So the first question is what challenges and barriers have you experienced to faculty buy-in for adoption of OER in their teaching practice and in their courses? And I would like to start uh, with Marie on our panel today. Thanks, Kim. Um, there's a variety of challenges a lot of people experience when we talk about um, OER and adoption. I find for, you know, talking with faculty and in different groups, a lot of people that want to move into an OER may not be the full decision maker. They're not necessarily the faculty who gets to make the final decision to adopt that. So that's sometimes a bit of a challenge in reaching a consensus at a departmental level sometimes also can be a bit of a challenge. Other questions around the quality of the resource sometimes come up. And even there's sometimes a bit of a reluctance to switch to a new resource. We all know when we talk about adopting a new resource, whether it's an OER or a traditional publication, there's often a lot of labor involved with that process. So that consideration is, is sometimes a challenge depending on the positioning. And so those are kind of the pain points some faculty will experience. And even some institutional barriers may be a consideration for some faculty meaning that the organizational culture may not have shifted to looking at OER as a credible um, opportunity for our students to experience. And sometimes there's also accessibility concerns and conversations around that. So, so those are my general thoughts around um, some of the challenges we may experience. Thank you, Marie. Uh, so I'd like to put it over to Mary now. Much the same um, from my point of view. So eCampus Ontario's Open Library does provide funding and support in program development, specifically around OER adoption. And uh, last year we launched the Integrating OER program, which is directly about providing stipends for OER adoption, peer review, and edits. 
particularly because of the exact issues that Marie just mentioned. We found in our research and in our conversations with our members that folks found it uh, challenging in terms of having time, having the expertise necessary to evaluate um, as two of the really big barriers. And of course, as Marie mentioned, sometimes finding a really an OER that fits their specific need can be challenging because of course it depends on what's available. And if time's already an issue, they might not have time to adapt to their course, especially if they're preparing for that course right now. Um, so that was definitely part of the rationale for part of how we designed that program. One of the things that we were really concerned about too in regards to stipend work was we wanted to make sure that faculty, instructors, TAs were compensated for their time, recognizing that there is an equity layer there as well, especially because if it's not part of your institution's policy in terms of recognizing uh, engagement with open education as scholarly work, they might not be um, their time might not be fully recognized, or they might not have institutional support to do that. We felt that this was one, one of the ways that we can help address some of those aspects. That's great. Thank you, Mary. I'd like to um, put it over to Judith now. Well, in addition to what uh, has been mentioned, I would say that uh, one of the main uh, challenges is resistance to change. You know, in any in any significant change, uh, that touches on teaching methods or materials can face resistance in any institution. Remember faculty members in most of our institutions are very comfortable with the traditional textbooks, uh, which they also publish themselves and tag students to them and resources, and maybe reluctant also to adopt new approaches of teaching and learning. And this is basically one reason that would make people to say no, I don't want to change my way of doing things. I love my traditional golden notes and I want to use them. So that is one reason. Another one is about, I think has been talked about on the lack of institutional support. You know, our universities and colleges might not provide the adequate support and incentives or resources for faculty to explore and basically adopt the OERs in our teaching, in our learning and in our researches. And so without such a support, so without us backing, faculty members may be less inclined to embrace OER. And that is something that I think we need to uh, talk on how we can actually counter so that these resources can be embedded in our teaching and our learning. Yes. Excellent. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Jenny now. Great, thanks, Kim. I think just to add on, you know, all those things I feel are true in my experience, uh, which is great. Um, an interesting thing, so I'm probably going to mention this a couple of times as we talk, but uh, I always circle back to Roger's Diffusion of Innovations. It's a, it's a, it's an incredible book and exploration of diffusion theory for innovations. One of the things he talks about, which I think is really important, is that certain innovations take a very long time to take effect. Uh, he talks about changing a, a nation to the metric system, which we went through in Canada. <laughs> uh, he talks about things like seatbelt, adoption of use of seatbelts. So there are some innovations that, that it's very clear that they're beneficial, but they still take a very long time because we're humans and change can take a long time. And so I kind of adopt a mindset around OER that Small wins are great, individual wins are great. Those early adopters, I love them. They're so impassionate about OER, but getting to the majority the, of, of users is going to take some time. So just kind of think time is the, is the key critical issue. Time for folks to, uh, to share their innovations, time for us to show those innovations as visible. Here's all the cool stuff that can happen when you do this. Um, and time post COVID, COVID has been a, has has crunched us all into you know tiny balls of stress. <laughs> I'll speak for myself on that front, um, but I feel like faculty still are not feeling fully recovered. Um, they're still quite busy. I know this is my experience at our institution, Kim. This semester startup has been just as busy or the busiest one we've ever had. So I feel like folks are still looking for that time where they can you know, do some reflection, do some reading, do some experimentation. So those are kind of my thoughts on that. That's great. Thank you, Jenny. And you're right. It has been a very busy startup. Uh, Pucha, I'd like to turn it over to you. Um, yeah, pretty much what I wanted to say, most of it has been covered, so I'm not going to repeat it. But a um, couple of things that come to my mind is um, 
depends on the course that the instructor is teaching. If the content is ever evolving, um, they, they are resistant because you know, an open education resource or textbook can't be produced as quickly as a publisher is working on. So that's one of the things. And the other thing I find is, and this is my personal experience when you say, okay, I'm gonna switch to an open education resource, the publishers are really good at negotiating with you. Say, so, okay, along with the textbook, I can, you know, give you other supports like, you know, um, e-platforms, adaptive learning, ready-made test banks and all that. So they sometimes the faculty find it easier to use those resources because once one, they're already been vetted and reviewed for mistakes. And the other one is, yeah, we don't have time to develop and spend time on adapting and creating those resources. So, I'm just adding those two to all the other things that have already been said, resistance to change, lack of trust in the quality of open education uh, resources and yeah, working um, on from the side of the desk. We people who are passionate about open education have been doing it on top of the regular work that they're doing for the for their students. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja, for those insights. Um, I'd like to turn my last panelist, last but not least, Emily, and then I'm going to pull in some comments coming in from the chat. Great. Thanks, Kimberly. Yes, yeah, so I don't have a lot to add to what's been said. Uh, what we face at Camosun, and I'm very fortunate to work with Pooja on some projects, is time for faculty. And related to that is when we have term faculty who don't have the time to create and may not be supported by their uh, departments or programs to do that work. The big one is also support. Uh, we A number of different supports were mentioned by other panelists. So we have leadership support. We have support in terms of people who do OER work, like librarians, perhaps, people in teaching and learning centers to support the projects that are out there, resources in terms of money and maybe granted release time. But one of the notes I wrote to myself as everybody was talking is that OER work takes a community. So it is a really, you also engage with students and how can students also support, push from the bottom and to build it in. We've been very lucky at Camosun recently to have open ed in some form built into our strategic plan. So finding ways in the door, but I appreciate, um, I think it was um, Jenny who said, it takes time and it's so hard to be patient sometimes when you're doing this work. So you kind of have to start small. So it's uh, for me also, it's patience. And the fact that there is nobody at our college who does this work except off the sides of their desk, including me, who is the one person who knows what is mostly going on at the college, which is kind of scary. So um, yeah, I think that's everything. Everybody else said everything else. Uh, it's nice sometimes to know that you're in the same ocean and maybe in different boats, but at the same time, it's a little frustrating at this stage of the game, but patience. Thank you, Jenny. That's awesome. Thank you for uh, recapping that, Emily. So some comments coming in from the chat that I think are very val valuable um, was around uh, textbooks around STEM. I'm just trying to scroll back up to the comment that I saw. Um, a business faculty member thought OER was more for the humanities and more objective subjects in it wouldn't well, work well for STEM areas. Has anyone on the panel experienced that kind of pushback? Not really, if I could jump in, not really um, in that sense, but I must say, uh, because I teach math and open education resources, entering equations mm -hmm is is a task in itself like even if you just want to enter a simple equation x plus two equals three if you're not um, keen to learn a new technology it can be a challenge um, luck i think i mean i've been working with oer for ages now over a decade so but the speed with which the technology has evolved post covid has been amazing so um but still, you need a technology. You need to be comfortable with learning a technology and be able to um, go through the whole process of entering tedious coding just to see uh, an equation on your screen. 
That's great. Thank you, Pooja, for offering that. Uh, I saw another one that I think uh, is something that I have found in the work that I do with faculty that sometimes it's difficult to find OER. It seems like now with this um, amount of OER work happening, especially since the 2020 dynamic OER coalition, uh, that it's everywhere. And so I know that is something that we're working on at Conestoga is like, how can we find, how can they be indexed in a way that make them more searchable? Has anyone else um, come up with a solution to that? <laughs> Mary, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, a solution, truly the dream of a librarian everywhere is to have fully federated access, I suppose, um, but uh, not easy to accomplish, I must say, because from the librarian's point of view, especially with OER, there is all sorts of interesting aspects of OER, as we all know. Doesn't matter what format it is, doesn't really matter. Uh, what subject area it is, it just matters the intent and the licensing, right? So then that leaves the descriptive aspect of helping make OERs findable and really interesting challenge is how I'll put it. I will say something that's really on eCampus Ontario's mind when working as Kim knows, um, the, on federating our records out into our member institutions first and foremost. And to that end, uh, we worked also with Ex Libris to be a metadata provider to them so that anybody whose library uses Ex Libris in later in fall will be able to have access to our fully open collection. And I do, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I believe I saw somebody from BC campus in the in the chat, but um, I believe BC campus, their collections, they've also been working with uh, metadata uh, uh, folks to make that available to library management systems and so forth. So in a way I would say from a, a librarian of a open library's point of view, I'm trying to identify where my main community is and how do I deliver to them? Because they're using specific software as well. So there's like the technical layer, there's like the technical layer in terms of software, technical layer in terms of library and metadata work, and then uh, as well as just like who, what partnership will make the greatest impact first. But I do think like a lot of folks who work in this type of field are also generally interested in open data anyway. So there's lots of work happening in those areas. Great, thank you for that. Uh, and so I'm just gonna address one more before I move on to our next theme question. Uh, and I think we talked a little bit around the equity of labor, but when we think about our adjunct faculty or our part-time or partial load faculty who teach many, if not most courses, sometimes at one institution, sometimes at two, are often left out of opportunities to create, adopt, and adapt. I wondered, um, has anyone else experienced this and how is this being addressed? And I put the, pose that to the panel. Feel free to unmute and jump in. I'll Tell just, me. I'll jump in really Thank quickly. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. Yes. We don't, I don't think we have any solutions for that. It's a, it's, it's not just an issue with creating and adapting OER, but um, well, the one solution I would like to pose at our institution, and I know there can be issues with getting buy-in as somebody else noticed with departments and program groups. But I think if you work with a program group to develop a ZTC situation for their program, then that supports term faculty coming in to teach in that program because the, the infrastructure is already set up for them to do that. And if you also provide ancillary resources for them like PowerPoint slides and question banks, then they're not going to go out and find a proprietary textbook to support them. So that's kind of where mine in mind is at right now is trying to work more at the department or program level to build that support up from the inside. That's great. Thank you uh, so much. And lots of uh, great comments. Um, someone has mentioned OpenStax, which comes with a, a full round of uh, ancillaries. Uh, I know that's one that we've utilized in some of our OER work. All right, so I'm moving on to the next question. Maybe we've addressed some of it. Uh, what has been the best strategy, and it could be multiple strategies, to overcome the challenges and barriers that we just discussed? And I think Marie, did I, shall we start with Marie? Sure, let's start. <laughs> so I guess there's, from my perspective, there's multiple strategies, but I, I really found for myself and our department and our college was a slow integration. The small steps, if, if you're new to OER, how can we bring small pieces into the course rather than maybe bringing in a whole new resource. So that's one strategy that I found very helpful. And at my college, what I found also very helpful was providing an, 
a framework for a proof of concept. This is what this OER can do for our program, for our course, and most importantly for our students. I think Emily mentioned, and I believe Jenny mentioned as well, how important it was to have that student voice in those conversations wherever possible. I also recommend focusing on one course at a time bring the institution into the conversation, find out what supports already exist. And you'll be surprised how many people are doing something at your institution around it, even in those small steps. And you may find those like-minded people. And that's what worked for me was finding a like-minded person. And it's like, whoa, this, this can really move forward. We have the opportunities. And also to think about the financial benefits for our learners, those, um, raw data certificate uh, um, information that can provide some real insight to how does this benefit our learners and how does it benefit the program and the college and the the community as whole so so those are some of my thoughts that's great uh thank you so uh, i'd like to turn it over to emily please yeah thanks marie those are some really good uh good solutions or good strategies um, I've already mentioned a couple of them. One of the big strategies I'm looking at right now, working with some of the librarians, is um, encouraging people to move to a zero textbook cost model, as opposed to worrying about finding and adapting and adopting OER, doing a mix and match. So if the library has resources that students don't have to pay for, how can we leverage those? If you can put course packs into D2L so students don't have to pay for them, then of course we run into the issues about how do students print them? How do, can we lower costs for printing for students? So we're in conversations about that as well. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is I think it's really important when you find people who are doing this work at your institution to celebrate them. You might not be able to celebrate them with money, but you can celebrate them by doing blog posts. You can celebrate them. We uh, started a, an open education award last spring. So bringing people in to celebrate the great work that they're doing and showcasing it whenever you can. Go to department meetings and talk about the great work some of their colleagues are doing in the department meetings so that people kind of go, oh, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And that's really cool. And now students are seeing it and they want it. So let's, let's all do it. So that's uh, some of my ideas. That's awesome. I'd like to turn it over to Judith, please. Yes, I, I like very much the way uh, uh, Emily has brought it up. Uh, recognition and celebration is, of success is quite important. Well, there's something that I hope for in my university, and I look forward to this, that if we can be able to, uh, I mean, to uh, to tag points for faculty ranking, then I think people will be able to give this, uh, you know, the, 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 the agency that it requires in terms of, you know, uh, in embedding OER in what we do. Uh, another is, is in terms of you know engaging with stakeholders. We need to start small and, and scale up with time. You know, it's it's, it's not a, a one day thing, as Jenny mentioned. It's a process, and it takes time. So uh, bringing on board and engaging with uh, all the stakeholders from time to time, and recognizing and also tagging a point in terms of ranking the faculty would, um, uh, would, would, would basically increase the levels of use and reuse of these resources in our institutions. And these are my hopes, yes. That's great, thank you. Uh, Jenny, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks, I have kind of a funny story to share. So <laughs> it's very still funny to me. Uh, when I was at, I was at eCampus Ontario in uh, 2016, 2017, um, up to 2018, as part of the Ontario um, Open Education Rangers program. And one of the things we were doing was uh, attracting or seeking to attract uh, open fellows from the various institutions in Ontario. And so we did a recruitment process and you had to send a video to talk about why you were passionate about OER. Uh, and we got a video from uh, Professor James Gidmore at University of Waterloo. And he said, I'm not passionate about OER. I'm passionate about a lot of things, but OER isn't one of them. <laughs> and, and it turns out that James was a real curmudgeon. Like he was really invested in the publisher textbook he was using and all these other things. But he was, he was curious enough to submit the video and and we and we invited him to be a fellow. I thought, let's take the opposite approach. There's always someone in a room or more than one person in a room who's really combative about OER. 
but it typically stems from from curiosity, fear of change, among other things. But but it also stems from curiosity. Uh, and it turns out that over time, as part of his fellowship, uh, I would see him at conferences that he would have, was invited to, carefully writing all the notes, all the presentations. He's turned out to be a terrific advocate for use of open educational resources, uh, but he needed time to think it through. He needed exposure to what other people were thinking, what other folks in his spectrum. So he's in the humanities. He teaches German at University of Waterloo, uh, and he's a terrific proponent now. And so sometimes that person that, that you think might be a curmudgeon is someone that actually is just really curious and wants some opportunities to learn more. Uh, and he's very influential just because of his nature. Um, he, you know, he has a big voice in his uh, in his department. And so I think that's really an interesting prospect around um, how we think what are the big wins that we can find in OER. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jenny. I think that I have cited James and many of my advocacy presentations. So that definitely was a good call on on your um, part. Uh, Pooja, would you like to jump in now? Um, yeah, it's it's good when I'm kind of in the end in a way, because most of the things I wanted to say have already been said. So <laughs> that's OK. But then I can share what I did to uh, get some faculty buy in from my colleagues. Um, I piloted an open source reg um, resource uh, within my own group and my classes um, and but before that I adapted I created uh, ancillary resources with it, powerpoints um, test banks I used uh, my open math as uh, to create um, because that's an open uh, platform to create test banks created you know all the questions worksheets and everything and I piloted it within my own class and got student feedback now once you have student feedback as Emily said when they show I'm so glad I didn't have to go buy a textbook I'm so glad that if there was an issue with the textbook it was readily corrected or when I provided feedback you know it was well received all those things when those comments were submitted I could go back and show my other fellow colleagues hey see there are some students who really appreciate that they are not going to spend two hundred dollars on a textbook especially for a tuition free course because i teach upgrading course and they're supposed to be tuition free so on one hand i'm saying come and do finish your grade 12 and you're not going to be paying any tuition and then I told them to buy a $200 textbook it just feels like whoa what am I doing here so um, and that when that happened I saw a lot of you know because the work was already done it was easier to switch from public uh, publisher textbook to an open resource it didn't happen overnight. It did take a few terms to get there, but and now I want to say the course that I adapted uh, that open source for is all the instructors that teach use that resource now. So that's what I've done. <laughs> Thank you, Pooja. That um, that's really interesting. I've just been learning a little bit about my open math. So th thank you for sharing that. And I just want to pass this over to Mary as our last panelist before I pull in some comments from the chat. Uh, so funny, Jenny, to hear you mention OER Ranger because that was one of the first things that came to my mind as well. Um, from the eCampus Ontario's work with our community, definitely we're really interested in building capacity in terms of human capacity. Uh, one of the things we see, as everybody knows, the people who are advocates, who are champions, really drive the work. So, um, from the previous work, we saw how many people have stuck around in open education, and this year we launched a way bigger version of that. So really, we have, at this for this particular program, it's called OER Rangers, uh, building from OER fellows, um, or just also uh, was an OER Rangers program, I believe. I think Jenny would know the history a bit better than I would. Um, but now for this round of it, we've expanded it, and we have, I think, representation for almost all of our member institutions really thinking about how can we build up the champions at each of our institutions. 
the human capacity to do the work, the human interest. And uh, so that's at the program level. So that might not be relevant for all of our individual institutions who are here. But the other thing that we found that's been really useful is to do OER sprints. Um, our team is leading some now. And in the past, we've done a lot of those with folks who are on this um, panel right now. And the sprints can be a, a short one day, half day or two half day experiences. Mm -hmm. It's much more digestible. It gets folks creating, which can really excite them and invigorate them and give them a chance to lower the barrier that, that they felt was there. That's one of the things that we found. And actually some of the OER that's been created through things like OER sprints, um, creation sprints, uh, are still some of our most widely used OER in the open library collection. Like the fundamentals of uh, business Canadian edition, very well used. Uh, we see it all the time when we look at our download metrics, we see it in our adopted uh, reports. And, and that was a collaboration through Ontario's colleges, actually. So you so we see the adoption reports coming in from multiple colleges. So, that, so there's a lot of opportunities there for collaboration with faculty members, but also an opportunity to create something within a short time frame. It doesn't have to be perfect. Building with some of what Pooja said there too, is that, but it becomes a usable object. And then you can start that slow process of being like making things more open bit by bit. That's excellent. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so I want to pull in uh, from the chat, Judith Sabesta, I'm sorry if I've pronounced your name incorrectly, um, but you're talking about um, technical assistance program for uh, ZTC acceleration grants, part of 115 million allocated for ZTCs by state and governor. I think many of us would be interested in, in how um, you know, to also be able to get a hold of those types of funds. I know in Ontario, we, we, we were part of the virtual learning strategy fund and a lot of OER work has come out of that fund, but making those kind of advocacy for that type of government support certainly goes a long way to addressing some of the concerns we heard right at the beginning around time, um, hopefully. So I don't know if everyone saw that, but I wanted to point that out in the chat. Uh, one thing I wanted to sort of ask about that um, I found has been helpful in my work is associating OER to other initiatives going on within the institution. Um, and that seems to get a lot of backing. So for example, um, our open access teaching case journal has teaching cases that are applied research and that counts as people's scholarship. And so I would just like to plant that idea of if you can make that connection to people's scholarship that sometimes you're able to get institutional support as well as faculty buy-in because it's a scholarly output for them with wraparound supports, for example. So we are moving into our last um, themed question. No, not quite last, almost. Uh, and this was actually, Pooja, you were going to go first this time, but I think you might have addressed it. I was going to say for our faculty panel members, now we've all been faculty at one point or another, uh, but we have a couple who are current faculty members. Uh, you still decided to participate in OER adoption. You must have had some of the same challenges we're talking about. So, uh, you know, time, resources. How did you overcome those challenges and why was it important for you to do so? So Pooja, if I could get you to go first and <laughs> you probably kind of already answered. But. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just zoning out a little bit. No, this is what happens when I go first. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So um, I was going to say that one of the reasons I went towards this OER, you know, it's not like it came naturally. I didn't even know they existed 10 years ago. So um, was, in fact, she used to be Emily's boss. Sybil used to be uh, the what Emily is today. And she was uh, nudging me in the directions of OER because I was having an issue with the publisher not giving me what I needed for my students. <laughs> and she was like, if the publisher doesn't give you, you go get your own textbook and you go create those resources and then share them. Okay, so that was good. And, and my reason obviously at that time to fight with the publisher was to reduce student cost. Like I didn't want my students to spend money on textbooks when they could use that on groceries and other uh, stuff for their children and um, so that was my uh, starting point and to get to the point where I am today where I feel very comfortable with adapting adopt and adopting the textbooks I had to 
um, you know, did quite a few professional development work. So I um, like learned what Pressbook is, how to use it, or WordPress, H, how to use H5P. Have learned multiple times different ways of entering math equations like LaTeX or my math or um, what's another one so several softwares i've learned but i find latex at them at this time is the best because it's more um universally adapt uh, you know received and it has better support compared to other um, um, softwares or languages and um, also Whenever I did created an open resource, I seek feedback from my faculty, my peers, my students. They are my best reviewers, and um, they are the they are, and they are not afraid of telling me if it's good or if it's it's not the best. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think what else. And the fact that I was comfortable with technology that helped me because I was able to create the ancillary resources myself. Um, and that was really my passion because I teach most of my courses online and online means you have to have some sort of a platform for which the students don't have to pay and the questions are not the same 10 questions that every student is getting. They're randomly generated, they're um, coded that are matched to the textbook, but not if I have, for example, right now I have 70 students, everyone is get, getting a unique test. So uh, that also was one of the issue when I started adopting an open platform was the issue of um, cheating in classroom students if they are living in the same home, they will be, you know, cheating from each other. I personally never thought like that. I all trust my students that they are adults and they have the academic integrity. Uh, but that was a concern with some of the faculty I was working with. Uh, but when everybody's getting a unique question, uh, that mitigated that um, that fear or issue, I guess. <laughs> That's yeah. That's really great, Pooja. I really like that you talk about focusing on trusting the students first. I certainly hear that a lot too. And I, I would probably have, would have people argue with me, but I think it's more common that students are trustworthy. So Jenny's put in a really um, good question in the chat for Judith. Judith, I don't know if you can see that. Um, Judith, we're interested in your perspective and how often does the issue of context come up with faculty in the nations of Africa? For example, the OER does not use local examples, although it could be adapted. How might that a barrier of a more societally specific example and even visual inclusion come up? Great question. Well, thank you very much, Jenny, for bringing this up. It's really a, 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 a case that uh, has become a re real barrier in terms of uh, adoption and use of these resources. Uh, one is the fact that uh, the African context in terms of the local uh, uh, language, languages that uh, can easily be interpreted to make meaning to real uh, situations in the on the ground is really an issue. And the, lo the local voices are missing because we borrow uh, a lot from the global north and therefore uh, people feel that they're not meant for us or maybe somebody is imposing something on, on themselves. But then we need to, uh, I mean, counter this and look at a different mirror in which these uh, resources can really support uh, in lowering quality, I mean, lowering costs of education to marginalized communities. I look at OER in terms of uh, its potential uh, in improving the quality of education and also access to a variety of resources that can be used to localize and help in solving the local problems within our context. And so, yes, this is, has been an issue and it's also a, it's a barrier. But at the same time, we also look, we need to look at the other aspect of giving it uh, and uh, looking at it positively and changing our mindset towards the potential that OER can do in our in, in, in our education in terms of increasing the quality, access to the marginalized communities, and also provision of uh, equity 
and uh, inclusion in terms of uh, resources across the, the spheres of learning. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We don't often uh, consider that, do we, when we're here in the global north thinking about the impact, but as we are pro producing OER to be shared worldwide, I think that's a really important perspective to bring up and for us to be mindful of here in the global north, for sure. Thank you for that. Um, Emily has popped um, one way that she can sell OER to faculty is the adaptability to contextualize. It takes time, but open textbooks much more customizable than traditional textbook. And you can integrate student work through open pedagogy as well. Yes. Emily, did you want to speak a little bit about co-construction before we move on to our next question? Yeah, just a little bit. I've seen some really great examples of uh, faculty using, not maybe not at Camosun, but I'm trying to work with faculty at Camosun to think about when you're uh, customizing their open textbooks and there are gaps. Have your students help you identify the gaps and then have them create the content for that gap and then they get attributed as part as an author in the open textbook. And I, I think that's a really powerful tool uh, because uh, a lot of faculty will say they want to keep a traditional textbook, but they have to say to the students, don't read chapters five through 10. Um, and then we have to rewrite chapter eight or chapter two in some way because it's American and not Canadian. I'm like, well, this is why you want to use an open textbook. <laughs> so I think it's a, it's a great way to engage with students. Awesome. Uh, and just did, oh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I just wanted to add to that. And it doesn't have to be a whole chapter. In my case, I asked my students to just write a question on the concept because I teach math. So why don't you create a word problem for me that could be added to the next edition? So, and every student loves that their work will be in one of the open textbooks going forward. So just a little, even just one question they will be happy to add something to your book. I think that's an excellent approach. Thank you for sharing that, Pooja. And for my other three panel members, just before we move on to the next question, was there anything you wish to, to add? I don't want to leave anybody out. I just wanted to jump in for a moment just to kind of recap what was Emily and Pooja was saying. My experience and where my passion really got driven forward was that co-creation element with the students involved. It made the development, the results, the improvements, because it is a work that needs to be sustainable. So oftentimes we update the OERs that we produced five years ago to make them more current. And that student voice has been the one key piece of what has made it so sustainable. Thank you, Marie. Yes, and it was fun to work with students, wasn't it? <laughs> um, Jenny and Mary, anything to add before I move to the next question? No? Okay. Awesome. So our um, last question is, what strategies have you used to incorporate EDIA into your work? So equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Has this uh, led to greater faculty buy-in? The same challenges exist, less faculty buy-in? Feel free to expand upon your answer. Judith, can I start with you this time? It's, I'd be interesting to understand that. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, we have uh, currently uh, come up with, a, um, I would say, a pedagogy in which we integrate uh, uh, OER in teaching, and this is basically tagged to um, uh, tagged to faculty ranking. So ev everyone feels yes, I need a ranking. Therefore, I need to do something before I get there. And for me, this I find this working very well. At the same time, also you know, awareness is still something. You know, uh, OER still for us, especially in Africa, still a new phenomenon. Uh, however, uh, it could look something that has been always been there. But then, to most of my people. I realize we still need to do a lot of awareness, a lot of capacity building, especially on you know digital literacy because um, this especially the, the devices come in a different language. And sometimes these languages could also bar people from using it. They feel it's not meant for us, it's for them. So how do we therefore integrate and inculturate people so that we can be able to have this? So a lot of training, 
capacity building is ongoing, especially in most of the institutions that I know that are basically uh, looking forward to embracing and integrating OER in their teaching, learning, and researches. And this, I find this working very well. And the, bar the, the barrier of resistance to change, I think people are slowly realizing, it's a process, uh, step by step. So realizing that we need to embed, we need to embrace, and we need to tap on the opportunity that comes with OER in enhancing the quality of education in our institutions. Thank you, Judith. Um, and I'll move over to Mary. I will have to say that these principles are something that's very top of mind for our entire team when it comes to program development. We think about it quite a lot in terms of how are, are, are the programs we're developing accessible to all of our community members. Um, a lot of the work we do is directly with the faculty as opposed to with students right away. But um, so that's the sort of, we're mostly thinking at that level. But we also talk about it in terms of how can we promote more open pedagogy as in terms of, uh, of access uh, work in terms of uh, promoting different aspects of the value of OER beyond that student savings aspect. And then there's also the other eye, which is indigenization. Since for us, we have indigenous institutions as part of our community, uh, of our member institutions, it's really important to us that we are thinking as much as also even be during the program development aspect, how we can make sure that our programs are accessible. Now, unfortunately for our member institutions, sometimes we are working with provincial deadlines. So one of the things we hear back is our timeline are sometimes a little rough and deeply sympathetic to that. But unfortunately that some, some of that is out of our hands, but we do try to see where we can be flexible. And that's something that's like an underscores a lot of the work we do. Even though we have these timelines, we see where we can be flexible to folks to, based on their capacity. We know that so many people who are doing OER work are doing outside our desk. I bet even more so for the smaller institutions, the Northern ones, the folks who are um, not as engaged right now. Um, so that's how we try to consider those things. And then the other aspect is that with most of our work, we try to be as open as possible. So, I mean, it's like, it is the open library, but uh, some of the stuff we do has a provincial focus, but where we can, we try to make things open. So for example, with our H5P studio, um, it's the, the accounts for creation are for our member institutions, but the, if, they, if folks choose to publish on open on H5P studio, anybody around the world can download it. So that's another way to kind of maintain a certain level of openness across all of our work. Awesome. I'm going to uh, pull in a question here from the audience, as I'm aware of time, and I will invite my panels, if I panel members, if you, I didn't get to you to answer all the questions, feel free to populate it in the chat. But the question from the audience here is, uh, for those of you who incorporate student feedback, how do you recognize student contributions? For example, incentives, extra credit, acknowledgement in the resource. I currently have two students doing review and input as an independent study for credit. However, when I pilot test resource, I would like to input from course students without making it feel like extra homework. Thanks. Would anybody on the panel like to address that question? I have In an our... idea. Oh, yep. Sorry, Sorry, go oh. ahead, Remy. Jenny, I think you're up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go quick. Um, make it worth a grade. <laughs> so I was teaching a critical thinking course and was invited to at Cambrian College, which I'm, I was very happy to do as even as an administrator. Uh, and the assignments around one of the principal assignments surrounded the sustainable development goals, students doing problem solving, practicing digital literacy, it was worth marks um, for them to create a post related to their research and connection with community members to talk about it. Uh, and there was some really beautiful culturally specific work that happened as part of that. So the students were very diverse, which is great. Uh, we ha I had an indigenous student tell a story about Water Walker and her community. I had a student from India talk about a recycling initiative they had done as part of their, uh, their uh, home degree. They were working on a graduate certificate. Um, so that speaks to all those, all the things we kind of talked about, making it culturally contextual. The students are doing the writing and the creating. They're getting marks for it. It's part of their assessment strategy. Um, academic integrity becomes less of a problem because it's clear the student is telling their personal story and using the sustainable development goals. So it's like all the things happening. Uh, if there's an opportunity in your course to create an assignment that's worth marks for the students. That's great. And I'm seeing in the chat, uh, Shauna is saying um, part of coursework, students are acknowledged if the work's outside of coursework, they're compensated. And Emily is saying there is um, opportunity to get some of the tuition money back. So really creative ideas. 
Marie, did you have something to add? I know you had unmiked. Well, really, Jenny's really conceptualized it in the fact that make it an assignment or project based, and it's really gets gets the involvement. But it's also to think about um, having the students included in the acknowledgements of the OER. We had students actually star in our video simulations, and it was great because they were actually, you know, for students by students, really. And it was great to have them involved in the, actually acting out the scenarios in the textbook. But of course, they were acknowledged in the acknowledgement. So it was just another offshoot. <laughs> and stipends, I think, for that particular one. Yes. Uh, so as I'm um, cognizant of time, I uh, was remiss at the beginning in inviting people to provide their land acknowledgement. And so uh, because that is very important and I think is my nerves about getting the meeting started, I would like everyone, if you would like to provide your land acknowledgement, uh, I will say that I'm very privileged to live and work on the traditional lands of the Harusini, and Ashwabe and neutral peoples. And I don't take that lightly and I work very hard uh, to work towards allyship and reconciliation. So feel free to add yours if you want. I just did not want this to go without uh, having done that. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know, are there slides still to put up, Liz, at this point as we're in our last five minutes or if anyone has any more questions, uh, we do have about four minutes left in this webinar. Okay. Ah, there we go. So uh, the webinar is coming up. Next one is designing inclusive and accessible OER courses, a focus on equity, diversity, and universal design for learning by Stephanie Green. And then measuring impact with open education course markings, I'm sorry, just by Beatrice uh, Canales. So please come and join us for the future uh, webinars. If you want to stay in the loop, uh, you can see our website under Getting Involved. You can join our community email or read our EDI blog posts and student OER impact stories. And we would invite you to let us know how we did so we can make sure that these um, PD webinars are meeting your needs. And you can do that by completing uh, the link. Let us know what you thought of today's webinar and all those kinds of things. Uh, I do believe slides and uh, videos are posted. Maybe Liz or Una can just confirm that or Lori Beth. That would be great. So thank you, everyone. This has uh, been a wonderful webinar. Enjoyed uh, all of the interaction in the chat. Thank you, Kimberly, and to all your panelists. It was wonderful. And they will uh, slides and uh, are posted um, along with the video. And it's also sent to all the registrants. Excellent. Thank you.